So how did you get a clinical attachment? Co-attachments? And I thought that you're a perfect person to answer that question. Caught up in between uh, going into football and working in psychiatry. Would you mean join football as a doctor or like as a player? How long was yours and where did you do it? Which hospital? Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Sisi, if you're new here, and I'm a Ghana medical doctor. And if you're an old subscriber, welcome back. You might be wondering, who's that DJ? <laughs> this we are, we are is Shaba. Music. We are doing music now. <laughs> it's not a DJ. Shaba is also a Ugandan medical doctor in the UK who I was so excited to find on YouTube as well. I'll link his channel in the description below and also put clips here. So he's a Ugandan medical doctor working in the UK. And yeah, hi Shaba, can you please introduce yourself to the people? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I'm a DJ, so I'll introduce myself as a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Shaba. I'm a doctor working and living in London. I make YouTube videos about how to work in the UK as a doctor, and I'm so happy to be here on CC's channel. Just for and... context, let me give you a context, CC. Yes. Just for context, I began doing YouTube because of CC. Oh. After watching your videos. <laughs> <laughs> so are you really a DJ, though? Because you really look like a DJ. Are you also a DJ on the side? or? It's possible. The name is Shaba, so I could be Shaba Ranks. Tell us, aha, uh -huh, Shabarangs, what is the meaning of your name? Are you what's your full name? <laughs> so Shaba is actually a Muslim name, it's Shaban. Ah. Yeah, so Shaban is a month before Ramadan. So I cut it short because of an error I made during P7, you know, when you're registering for <gasps> for yeah. I don't remember the name, but it's something we feel. Yes, I, yes, yes. I remember our forms. And I forgot to put an N on my name. Uh, so the other name is Baguma, Baguma Shaba. Ah. So in Uganda, it would be Baguma Shaba. In the UK, I'm Shaba Baguma. Ah, your first name is Shaba. Yeah, first name is Shaba. Nice yeah. to meet you, Shaba. Nice to I'm meet you, I'm wondering. <laughs> so anyways, the reason I really wanted you to have come on my channel here is to ask you about yeah. clinical attachment, because I saw you've done a video about how you did a clinical attachment in the UK. And I see it a lot on forums, people asking about clinical attachments, and I thought that you're the perfect person to answer that question. So how did you get a clinical attachment in London? Oh, thank you, Cissé. Thank you, Cissé. So maybe to give a, a definition of this. So a clinical attachment has different names. Mm. Some people would call it an observership. Others would call it a placement. Mm. So uh, this is where you're based in a hospital. You haven't like gotten your license, but you're based in a hospital and you observe what the consultants in the UK do. So mm. It's very common for someone who has just moved to the UK to do this. Number one, it helps you with uh, experience. Mm. builds your CV and uh, coming from a world that's a bit different from the practice of medicine in the UK. A lot, a lot something, different. Exactly. Mm. You need something to introduce you to the medical practice here. Okay. So we always, you always, we are always advised you do a clinical attachment or a placement or an observership. It's the same thing. The okay. definitions are always different, yeah. How long was yours and where did you do it? Which hospital? So I did mine in London at South London and Mosley. Ah, the slum. slum. Exactly. <laughs> the famous slum for psychiatry. It's a, it's a psychiatry hospital. It's the yeah. one of the most famous in the world, I think. Yeah, it's very famous. So I, did, mm. I did mine at slum. It was uh, ideally people usually do it for four weeks, mm. but mine was a bit different. Mm. Uh, just to give context, I've done a master's here. So I have a master's in mental health. Yeah, so I was working as an assistant psychologist. You have an MS in global mental health? No, in mental health, not global. Just in mental health, eh? Yeah, mental, ah. health is, mental health is more superior than global. <laughs> <laughs> it's because global means for us, low and middle income countries. Exactly. Like so, Uganda. Right. So, this is so interesting. So, do you want to be a psychiatrist as well? Or Caught up in between uh, going into football and working in psychiatry. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, guys, I have to look at the screen because I'm using a, a camera mm. here. So, don't, don't mind mm. my eyes moving around here. Mm. So, uh, I'm looking at that joining football or working in psychiatry. So I'm still torn up in that. Mm. So I'm looking at the pathway to follow. I'm still finding myself. I'm lost. So, wow. So when you mean join football, would you mean join football as a doctor or like as a player? No, no. So as, as a doctor. So in the UK, if you do GP training, mm. you can do GP training. From GP training, you can join sports and exercise medicine. Right. Sports but medicine. that means you have to first become a GP first for you to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like that would be a shorter thing because you do a GP for three years and then yeah. sports medicine is how long? Three years, six years, same as psychiatry. <laughs> right, so it's exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. 
that is a tough one. We wish you luck. Comment below. What do you think Shaba should go for? Should yeah, he go exactly. for the sports medicine? <laughs> or should he go for psychiatry? Obviously, I am team psychiatry. But at the same time, sports medicine sounds so interesting. I wonder if they have like sports psychiatry. Because I'm sure medical people, sorry, sports people must have a lot of mental health, like stresses and pressures as well. I think um, they do because if they have uh, sports psychologists, they must be having sports psychiatrists. So it's uh, yes, so we know yes, them. because also in our CASC exam, which is the final exam for psychiatrists, we have a few yeah. stations that are for for um footballers. Yeah, that they usually come up with like these, like mental health stuff that becomes physical in that someone maybe has been scoring a lot of goals and now yeah. they don't and now they are affected and so they come to the psychiatrist. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, back to the point, which was you come to SLAM, you yeah. are doing an observership attachment, but you yeah. have that background of mental health, so it all makes sense. And you're yeah. working as an assistant psychologist. I was. I was working as an assistant assistant psychologist before doing my club exams because mm. I've been here for, for quite a number of years. So I did that. How so, many years uh, have you been here? Uh, so this is my fourth year, I think. Mm. It's my fourth year, yeah. So okay. I've been here for a while. And uh, uh, as I was working as an assistant psychologist, I got bored. The pay was good, I won't lie. I was earning mm. a decent income. Mm. So I got bored and uh, I was like, let me go back to medical practice. Mm. So I did the PLAB exams. I passed my PLAB exams. So once I finished my PLAB too, I was like, let me do a clinical attachment. Mm. So what I was saying, uh, people usually do for four weeks. But my scenario was a bit different because I was based in the same hospital where I was doing yes. the attachment. Yes. So I didn't mind for two months. Because mm. I was doing uh, three days in a week. Mm. Usually, a clinical attachment or a placement is a full time thing. Mm. You have to do it full time, Monday to mm. Friday, for one month. But mine was three days in a week, so it, it took me two two months. Okay, so yeah. there are a lot of things that are very specific to you and very personal. Like it's not like a maybe one size fits all. We can't come and say we'll copy and paste exactly what worked for you. But I'm sure you can advise people, generally speaking, if someone was to get a clinical attachment, where do they start? Where do they, what's the starting point really? So usually the starting point is the most difficult still because you you identify a hospital and usually if you email the hospital, they're going to ask you to pay money. That's the first thing. They'll be like, pay mm. money to ask for you to do an observership here. Mm. Or they give you an, an option, you contact your consultant. So contacting your consultant is very, very tricky. I think you've seen this. You say these guys are busy. They are mm. mad busy. So finding the emails of a consultant will be the biggest challenge you're going to face. Mm. For you to avoid paying money and you choose to find a consultant on your own, you have to use medias like uh, like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, look at their journals, find their dig. Basically, you're digging everything. Mm. You, you become an FBI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you become an FBI. I find their emails and you email them and be like, I'm, I'm doctor so-and-so. Mm. I want to do an attachment and your observation. And once they accept to take you on board, majority of the hospitals in the UK, okay, I'm familiar with London because that's where mm. my life has been based. So majority of the hospital, hospitals in London are going to accept for you to work under their, obs their observation for free. Mm. But if you're like, I don't want to go through that hassle, yeah. some hospitals are going to ask you to pay money. Yeah. Yeah, and the money is usually heavy. It's a lot. I've seen and you try to forums. guess. Mm. You seen the forums? How how much yeah. have you seen? I think I saw someone was saying like three thousand pounds for two weeks. Is that? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Mm. So, like guys in Saint Thomas, one of the hospitals in London would ask you to pay fifteen hundred. <gasps> That's one thousand five hundred pounds per month. But that means and, you're paying that. They will give you a consultant. Plus also. Then. But then you also have to pay for your accommodation. Like if you've come, let's say you've come from abroad, yeah. then you um, had to pay for a visa. I think this is a good option if you happen to already be here. Yeah. Or you happen to already have other things you've come to do. Like maybe if you've come for Plab 2 and yeah. then you align your things so that your dates are in that way, it can really be helpful. And yeah. did you well, did you find it helpful to have that clinical attachment? And now, and now currently you're working. What, what are you yeah. doing now, actually? So mainly at the moment, I've been doing so much locums. Uh, we spoke mm. about this off air. Off air. Mm. Mm. Uh, locums pay more money in the UK. So I've been doing lots of locums around, but I'm looking at joining full-time work because I want mm. to join specialty training eventually. Yeah. Mm. So I want to make that transition into full-time work. Mm. Uh, back to the point, uh, 
a clinical attachment can be done by anyone, whether you're from abroad or anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're here or from anywhere else. Mm. The, f- the thing is, as long as you're willing to go through that hassle mm. of finding a consultant, because everyone does it, that means you can also do it. You can do it. So, yeah. And also, I think the hard thing might be finding the consultant's email. But once you email them, they might take long, but eventually they'll reply. That's what I know about most people here. And usually they reply their emails. So it's just yeah. that it might take a while. But depending on how determined you are, it's yeah. worth considering. And okay. did you find that it was helpful to have that clinical attachment experience to also when you now went into real practice or so like, like real work, especially yeah. now that you're doing local work, did you find that it helped to have that experience? Yeah, so, so my context is a bit different. Remember, I was more exposed to the NHS before. Mm. But still, I, I realized one thing, because mine was in psychiatry. Mm. The way the word drowns are done is a bit different from what we are used Completely to. Completely different, yeah. Because this thing of like typing at the same time you're doing a word round, yes. everything is computer systems and all, yeah. Yes. So I think I picked up lots of experience through that. Mm. And so, yeah, it, it did help me a lot during my locums, I did. And mm. the other thing is... Uh, much as I was doing this as an assistant psychologist before, uh, for you when you're applying for jobs and having a clinical attachment on your CV mm. makes it a bit different. Mm. Yeah, it gives you gives it a bit of a weight. It gives you, it gives you an edge. Yeah, Definitely. so they be like you. Yeah, you've been working with doctors, so it makes more sense. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What is your experience of working as a doctor in the UK? What are the pros? Have you found it as a, is it a positive experience for you or? Yeah. Uh, Generally speaking, I want us to be honest, it pays well. Like, it does pay better than... Especially home. you who's doing locums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're doing locums, you're earning so much money. Because locums, you can work with agencies. And uh, agencies pay you per week. So you do your shifts at the end of the week. That's Friday. Your car money is in, on the account. It's motivating. Next week, you come back, you do the same thing. So the pay is uh, much better than back home. That's one advantage I saw. Then the other... The other is uh, you're working in a system that's very, very functional, very functional. To be honest, you say I had never seen something like this because uh, we are Ugandans, both of us. And you know how the situation is back home. Uh, systems don't work. You write a referral, a patient takes eight hours to leave the hospital. Uh, you you try to consult a consultant, takes ages or they abuse you sometimes. They'd be like, you know what you're doing. But here systems do work. That's one thing I appreciate. Then the, the healthcare, the level is a bit different. It's more, more advanced. Mm-hmm. So I once did, an, did a locum at a place that does liver transplants and that liver transplants do happen. People do them. And these are, thing, these are things we read about in books back home. In books. Mm, yeah. That's dreams. So, <laughs> so the experience of seeing such a thing, a functional system and things that do happen, you order labs and labs are actually done mm. without you having to follow up and beg people to do them. It's very motivating, yeah. Mm. So about the cons, the cons, of course, uh, being far from home is very, very challenging. Yeah. For someone who has not traveled and left their home country to live somewhere else, it gets to you at times. You miss home. Mm. Not, no amount of money is going to buy yeah, definitely. the place you have when you're home, yeah. What about visiting? How often do you visit back home? Uh, rarely, though I keep in touch with people at home, yeah. Mm. Uh, the food, the food. I, I find it very, very challenging when I moved here. Mm. Back home, the food is a bit different from what we have here. Yeah. I don't know if you experience the same thing. Definitely. The food in Uganda is sweeter. The fruits yeah. are like sweeter. It yeah. is better, fresh, like meat is fresh. I even yeah. think I, I'm becoming vegetarian because the meat here is not as like good. Yeah. So mm. so the food, I found it very, very challenging. So number one, being a Muslim, uh, everything, everything almost has pork. Mm. like everything so i spent a whole year without eating yeah. meat because i became I, I a lived, vegetarian <laughs> i became a vegetarian so i was eating chicken and mm. the chicken is not healthy you end up gaining no. weight mm. then uh, i'm on the person like who, chemicals yeah so i'm on the person who cooks food i spent a time like I, my partner wasn't here mm. so she joined me like after mm. and i was eating out all the time so i was spending you too know much how money. to cook okay <laughs> I never had the time. <laughs> I didn't have the I time. Know, okay. People teach your sons how to cook. Eh? It's a I life skill. Ha- mm. I didn't have time to, to cook. So I found it very challenging. It became very, very expensive in terms of food mm. and all. Uh, but overall, then the other issue is, uh, of course, racism exists. Being black mm. in a predominantly white country, mm. uh, you would face those comments. I remember the first year I came here and uh, I think people can sense it that you're in a country. 
Mm. I sat on a train and someone stood up and sat somewhere else. Mm. That was very, very bad. Like I, it, mm. it didn't make me feel well. Then yeah. in hospitals, of course, if you're working with patients who are old, sometimes they'll make certain comments. They'll be like, go back to your country. I want to speak yes. to someone who is English. Yes. Stuff like that. But like yes. you absorb that and move on. But when they tell you to go back where you're coming from, eh? yeah. For me, actually, no one has asked me for me to go back where, to where I'm coming from. But I have my answer ready. Yeah. I'm like, I go back where I'm coming from. I'm going nowhere. <laughs> I'm going nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So I worked with a patient who had a brain injury. And that's the thing. Like brain injuries, they, they become disinhibited. They say things they that do. are usually... But you know, mm. in my opinion, sorry to cut you off, but in my opinion, because they say that a lot about also people in psychiatry, like they're like, oh, he's maybe unwell, maybe they are manic. But I feel like a lot of times when you get disinhibited, it's your own true character that comes out. Because there are a lot of people who you find they're disinhibited, yes, they yeah. are manic, but they're not going to be racist. They will abuse you. They are abusing everyone, but they're not going to give racist abuses. Well, there yeah. are those who are. So me, I feel like maybe it's that actually it was really in you and now it has come out. Eh? Hmm. Yeah. You go so you on think, you telling me about the brain injury patient. Yeah. You think they are subconsciously racist and they didn't know? Yes. Yeah, that's that's, that's what I also think. think. That's what I Because mm. some of them, of course, become nice. Others become totally off. Mm. And they say certain things that are mm. out of contrary. Yeah. Of mm-hmm. course, you absorb it, you get used to it, and your life continues. But overall, I think the pros outweigh the cons. Mm. And I would never in my life discourage someone from leaving their country to move to a country where they are getting better money, better pay, a better life, and a better future in case you're planning on having a family. Mm. At least you try it out. You can yeah. always try it out. And if it doesn't work out, you can go back. Now, like me, now I'm here, but I tell my long term plans. I see myself in Uganda. That's a funny thing. <laughs> But I, I started to love Uganda more when I left. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't have known if I had not left. I would have still felt like, mm, I think there's something better out there. Yeah, that happens. Like once you leave home, you you appreciate home more. Like you you miss it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um. Thank you so much. Um. Maybe do you have any final words or advice for anyone out there who's watching and yeah. they want to do a clinical attachment? But... Yeah. So so maybe about that. Uh. Yeah. One thing I would say, when you're applying for your clinical attachment, they are going to ask you for certain things, like certain requirements. They'll ask you for things like uh, vaccination checks. You make sure you don't have TB, you don't have measles, uh, varicella, zoster. Then they'll ask you for a police check or a background check from your country. And if you're based in the UK, they are going to ask you for a DBS check, which is an equivalent of an interpolator. Mm. So get every document ready, prepare, because that's the, the, the thing that will delay your application. So once you have every document you in place, contact the consultants. Don't fear. Like these are human beings like you. They were once doctors. They were once junior doctors. They were once interns. They were once medical students. So go ahead and send them the emails. Ask them. Like if you don't ask, you never know the response. If you don't ask, you can never get. What's mm-hmm. the Bible verse? You have not because you ask not. Okay. If you don't ask, no yeah. one will ever give you. Like the moment you ask them, they'll be like, yeah, it's okay. You can come and do. And uh, contact the consultants. Once they accept, submit your papers, come do the attachment and yeah, start your life. Okay. And um, I also wanted to add that actually the British Ugandan Doctors Association exists. Yeah. We have a British Ugandan Doctors Association. And I didn't know that. You're segregating yeah. me. I didn't know that. <laughs> we do have one. You should join. I'll send you yeah. the link. And um, we're actually organizing a drop-in session to discuss racism <laughs> and experiences of racism in the workplace and how people yeah. are like managing with that and it's going to be like a safe space it's going to be virtual on zoom to be on the 25th of february hosted by me actually and mm-hmm. <laughs> a few other like committee members will be there too so yeah. if you are a ugandan doctor in the uk you do want to be getting in touch uh we have an instagram page i will link it below and i'll put a picture of our instagram page where yeah. you can come and see so we provide pastoral support which is just providing i guess advice from people who have been there yeah Especially if you're new to the uk you want to talk to other people who are like you where to find ugandan food because for instance in london it's when i because i lived in london when i first came and honestly you can get ugandan food in london that's one of the things that I missed when I left is that you can't, the accessibility of Ugandan food was so much more in London. Like everywhere you would find Matoke. And like yeah. here, where the specific places you have to go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just find other people. Like don't isolate yourself. 
if you're out there. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and do go to Shaba's channel that I'll link below and subscribe and comment and all his videos and also if you want to watch more videos from me subscribe if you're not subscribed and like this video if you liked it thanks guys see you in my next video bye bye thank you so, so thank you so much for having me cc